Is the microphone turned on? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Hope I have a loud voice. So I'm pleased to announce uh, Marco Heisig, who's going to talk about high, distributed high performance computing in common list. Um, yeah, everybody welcome on stage. Oh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, distributed high performance computing <coughs> in common list. Um, the table of contents, I will briefly explain what I mean by high performance computing because it's somewhat ambiguous and about message passing and what we build on top of this. And uh, if I say we in this talk, then it's usually two people, Nicolas Noyce and me. Uh, Nicolas can unfortunately <coughs> not be here. We are both from the University of FAU Erlangen Nuremberg. Um, and he is the author of FemLisp, for some that knows it is a finite element package in common Lisp. Um, yes, high performance computing. Um, high performance computing are things like this. Um, we have weather simulations. Um, uh, definitely the, the origin of high performance computing comes from, from uh, nuclear weapons. I think it was the first thing that was simulated, but we are luckily not involved in stuff like that. So uh, molecular dynamics, uh, structural mechanics. So you always uh, applications where you discretize some, some physical system in a way that you can predict and make predictions with your computer. And this has both uh, enormous demand for compute resources because a single glass of water is like 10 to the power of 23 atoms and you can never reach that scale practically. So, uh, yeah, and there is also money in the thing because it saves lives or things like that. So you have both the, the demand for compute resources and the money to actually buy an expensive system. So that's HPC in a nutshell. Um, yeah. Our application that we are discussing is called FemLisp. It's a finite element method a toolbox written completely in common list by Nico Noyce. And with the finite element method, you can essentially discretize differential equations on, uh, on, on some uh, provided grid. Uh, so you have a grid that discretizes your domain. You, you bring your equations on this grid and solve it or at least approximated, and FEMLIS features also integrated graphics. It's interactive, as you would expect from a Lisp application, and also because it's written Lisp, we could make it rather generic, so you can work with unstructured meshes in arbitrary dimensions. And our problem, however, is that FEMLIS was written um, to be beautiful and not to be, to be a high-performance application in the first case, which is a good thing. But so, so FEMLIS 2013, uh, 2014 was one computer running FEMLISP and you, you type your equation and eventually you get the result. And this eventually can take several minutes to hours depending on your problem. So we were hoping that um, when we use more resources and we have them at our university, we can get much bigger problems, more accurate problems in much less time. So we are hoping to be able to use machines like this. This is a state-of-the-art supercomputer. Um, the hardware that's about what we have at our university, we have 560 nodes uh, featuring uh, 11,000 cores, and each of those nodes is connected with 40 gigabit per second InfiniBand, so a single network card costs about as much as this computer. Um, but we can't use it, uh, or we couldn't use it before. And the question was, how do we bring our application, FEMLISP, on computers like this, and we investigated how can you do parallel computing. And yeah, you know, there are basically three approaches, the good, the bad, the ugly, I called it, from the programmer perspective. And so the good thing would, would be something like functional programming and actors that, that pass messages, because it's, it's a robust approach. Alan demonstrated somehow, but the disadvantage is that you, you, it's hard to predict the performance, and you duplicate data a lot, so, so there's no no way to get down to the metal and, and really get performance out of that. So we can't use this one. Then the, there is the, we call, I call it the bad approach, like everything is shared. We have a global shared 
space. There are models that use this, but it's, it's like sharing a beer with someone. If you have more than two people sharing a beer, it gets really awkward. And so, so no shared memory programming. And the, the compromise that we use is um, message passing. So you have processes with state and side effects and everything, and they communicate via some kind of messages. So this, so we ended up with MPI, because luckily there is a well-established standard that is supported by every distributed system supercomputer on the planet nowadays, and it's called MPI. And we provided now a Lisp interface that we can actually use MPI gracefully on our systems. Um, yeah. And when I looked at the MPI standard, I realized it's surprisingly similar to common Lisp in several aspects. <laughs> and the first is it's, it's enormous. It contains everything in the kitchen sink because it aims to be a standard. So you have to, uh, to contain strange things that some vendors demand. And however, the, the, the people there are really intelligent. So it's a great standard, but it's enormous. And you have in both domains, people are rambling about this should be done better and this and this, but it's still the established standard as of now. So, so actually quite similar, uh, the message passing standard that just describes how to send a message. And to illustrate this, I have a simple example. Um, the simplest I could come up with, how do you write an MPI application that sends a single message containing a single byte from A to B? This is the C code. So it's not a PGP signature, it's actually C code. And <laughs> the, the important part is um, that you, you have this MPI in it and finalize, which says this process that I spawned should have MPI enabled. And you, you launch a number of processes. This is the paradigm. You have one executable and you launch it n times. And the only difference in them is that they have a different rank and know the size, so how many are there of us. And then you can say, if I'm rank zero, I send, and if I'm rank, no, rank one, I receive a message. And yeah, you always need matching sends and receives, but this is the, the essence. But we don't want to write this, of course. And CLMPI, I, I described it to a friend of mine and said, so it's a, web, it's a wrapper library, but it's more than that because uh, MPI is, is not just a single C library that we could also write in Lisp, but it's a standard. So there are supercomputers with proprietary network interfaces, but they nonetheless provide MPI. So it's useful to be able to, to use whatever is pre-installed on this machine. We try to have it somehow Lispy, which means in particular no foreign pointers to memory and does not crash. Um, because the, the default in MPI is unfortunately that uh, the arrow handling consists of SecFort because it's more convenient than uh, the most people don't check the return value. So it was decided the same thing is to, to just SecFort per default. Uh, yeah, not pleasant from, from the Lisp experience because my repo won't respond anymore. And yeah, we need to make it fast enough that people would actually use it and not just write it themselves somehow in an ugly fashion. So what have we changed? Um, the, the, I picked out one single command. This is the, the, the heart of MPI. It's MPI send. Um, you send a void pointer to data. You say, I want to send n elements of some type. You need to specify the type because of endianness conversion reasons. I want to send it to a certain destination, the number of someone else. And I can tag it so that only matching tags match. And there is a communicator which allows you to say this section of the code should never exchange messages with a different communicator. This makes the code modular. And what we ended up with uh, writing this in Lisp is, OK, first, no error code. We, we don't need that. We have better things. So we, it, it's just a way. Uh, you, you, it, it gets checked, and you receive a condition if, if you have a problem. Um, and the next thing is void pointers. Uh, are ugly, but we managed to get rid of this because simple uh, arrays or, or vectors in Lisp of, of, uh, of standard types like, like double float or something are actually contiguous in memory. So we can exploit that and say we can take a, every vector of, of certain type as input. The source is the same, and instead of having n and the type, we already know the type because it's dynamically typed. We just take a start and the end of the sequence. The tag is a keyword argument because mostly you don't use it, and com. 
is also a keyboard, uh, key, uh, uh, keyword argument that defaults to a special variable because that's what you actually want for this section, use a new communicator. And typically, this makes the code boil down to something like this. It's a two-argument function, which is much nicer to use. And at this point, a big thanks to Stelian Ionescu, but he's not here, I think, um, because he wrote static vectors, a package that allows you to say this, this is both a, a list vector, but it should also not move in memory, because if the garbage collector would move your, your arrow, array, which he could, then your MPI code would be broken for, for some cases. So, but using static vectors, we, we get same semantics. Okay, so features, all sorts of communication, as I said, including the kitchen sink, uh, collective operations, synchronization between process, uh, between all the, the things. Um, it's fully integrated into ASTF and QuickLisp, so you can just load it and it works. And the key question, um, what about performance? Um, this question comes up from two different sides. The one is, why don't we just use sockets and TCP for communication? Why do we need an extra library? And the other thing is from the C perspective, how much worse is it than if I just write my uh, C or Fortran code? And yeah, I made benchmarks to answer those questions. What, what I took is uh, IMB is the Intel MPI benchmark suite. So that's about how good it can get. This is from Intel. I, I used it, uh, this is the test platform, and uh, so it's, it's not distributed in the sense. So it's, it's just from one core to the other in this case, which is better for this demonstration because I'm not interested in benchmarking the network interface, but the, 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 uh, the, the C code, the, the API. So this uh, IMB is the Intel MPI benchmark suite. You can't get faster than this, I hope, or I think. And CLMPI, that's... Lisp code I wrote with CLMPI and 0MQ. I'm not sure who's familiar with that. Uh, it's, uh, uh, they call it sockets on steroids. It has Lisp bindings. It's uh, robust TCP sockets where you can just exchange also vectors. Okay. So those are the contestants, and I had a quite surprising result. Uh, this is the the, I, uh, the benchmark is just ping pong. So I, I take a message and send it back and forth between two processes. And the, the question is then, if I just send this message back and forth, how, many, how much bytes can I transfer per second? So this is the plot. And uh, I was surprised that there's actually such a big difference of two orders of magnitude. It's a log-log plot. Uh, so if I just send a single byte like, uh, like a character or something with those different protocols, then I get less than 100 kilobytes per second if I use TCP messages because they have quite a lot of overhead. And if I use MPI, I get uh, beyond two megabytes. And yeah, it's a log scale. So the difference because of between CLMPI and, and IMB is still almost a factor of two, but for the very, very special case of single bytes from one CPU core to the other, usually there would also be a, a uh, much bigger latency because you have to go over your net network hardware. You can also calculate the spec to how big is the latency. In two, uh, 2016, what is the latency of sending one byte from A to B on a computer? And for MPI, this is a latency between 215 nanoseconds and 600 nanoseconds for CLMPI, so it's extremely fast, I think. And for zero MQ, uh, MQ it's, it's not that bad. It's like 35 microseconds, but much, much slower than you can actually do. And also, if you, if you go to bigger messages, you end up with, uh, on this computer, 10 gigabytes per second that you can communicate between processes if you need to, compared with one gigabyte uh, with zero MQ. So yes, it's actually worth doing this and using MPI. That's the message I try to get over. And finally, uh, we would never use MPI directly. This is, this is infrastructure, so you need some abstraction on top of that to, for your code. Otherwise, you cripple all your software with MPI calls. So we need a protocol on this that fits our application. And the first we came up with, yeah, let's code a distributed repo. And it was an ultimate failure. Um, so the idea is you, have, you, you can send pieces of code, and everyone executes the same code, so you have to make a a case, uh, if I'm ranked this, I communicate to the left and to the right and things like that. 
And the, the end is you make errors, and every single typo you make is a, is a deadlock, and it's, it's horrible to use. So it didn't work out as I hoped. So we, we reflected, brainstormed, and said, OK, what is actually our problem in HPC is um, what we do is we, we launch the application. We have some domain with uh, input, and we distribute it among the processes uh, as, as good as possible. And afterwards, we just iterate between, we do some local updates and the, the boundaries of, of our local piece of state that we have, we have to synchronize and forever and ever. And the question is, can we abstract on this pattern? And so we ended up with DDO, uh, Nico Noyes had the idea, dynamic distributed objects. Uh, so what we did is, we, we, it consists of three operations. You can say make distributed object and say make a, this an object that is distributed between rank two, three, and four, or left and right. So and this takes just any any Lisp object. Uh, you can declare that an object had, has been modified, and the magic command is synchronize that does its best to uh, to get uh, the same objects on on different ranks so that it's actually after I call synchronize all the objects should be equal in some sense so that's what we ended up with and this is a, a rather flexible approach because most data the, the bulk of the data is is, is is private to the processor but some things get synchronized but we don't have to explicitly say do this or this but we just say okay we just modified this piece of item and this is a rather flexible approach that works for HPC. Just quickly, the implementation details. Um, it's built on top of CLMPI and also L parallel for sending code back and forth. And uh, under the hood, we have triples of, so just the relation of everything has an ID. And we, we track which ID locally on which rank has which remote ID. We have one big weak hash table of all distributed objects because we want them to be garbage collected in the usual fashion. And yeah, we manage those relations somehow so you can query what is the idea of this on this processor. And yeah, the features are uh, you have distributed objects and the garbage collector collects them in the end if no one uses them anymore. Uh, you just communicate what's necessary. And of course, it's usable for Femdisk when we used it to parallelize many portions of Femdisk already. So, results. Yeah, right. So I just present the results. We did benchmarks. We haven't parallelized all of them. This, this will take still some work. But uh, for let's say a diffusion problem, you have to assemble a gigantic system of equations uh, and a right hand side for your for your problem that you can then solve. And we did benchmarks uh, for this diffusion problem on a domain of 16 times 16 times 16. Uh, with a very accurate uh, um, discretization strategy of fifth order, which means you have inside each cell a lot of um, a lot of nodes also. So we have in the end uh, 550,000 scalar unknowns. And originally, before we started working on it, it took minutes to get the solution, which made Nico quite unhappy because you cannot. Uh, work interactively. So you cannot just, oh, I wonder what happens, and look at your results and refine your strategy. But <coughs> I mean, this is a copy break. So uh, you can each time get a copy, you just want to run the simple pro problem. And the first thing was we made it thread parallel. That brought a huge speed up. But now we can also, with CLNPI, go to two or four computers and get quite a decent speed up and end up with something like 10 seconds for using four computers. Um, yeah, we wanted to make bigger benchmarks with our, on our uh, HPC compute center, but we didn't make it in time because it's somewhat fiddly to write batch scripts that launch Lisp in images. So, but we we can do that, but we didn't manage for the paper. And a final remark: um, if you get speed ups like this, that you almost get perfect scaling. That's unfortunately also a sign that your application is not optimal uh, tuned to the hardware. So so. Um, there is also something uh, we could also make the the, the single core code better, but uh, this way we can use four, eight, twenty. We don't know how many computers, so we we can now utilize all resources that our university has for whatever math problems we have, which is quite quite cool. And yeah, final slide um, results. 
FEMLISP is significantly faster. And everyone in the community uh, who is interested can now write portable LISP programs for supercomputers and just build a static image and launch it. And uh, the most important thing, I think, is now you can try to develop HPC languages on LISP in, in this sense that you can do macro expansion, whatever, on, on some abstract notation to generate good code, uh, which is, I think, a very interesting research topic because currently we don't know how to write code for a, uh, for a computer with 200,000 cores. So, yes, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Time left for questions. Eight minutes. Well, yeah, here we do it in linear and linear. As I understand, the most time-consuming operation is actually to solve the system of linear equations. Yes. Mm. What's what else in linear and linear is time-consuming, I and mean, what we are trying to optimize? Uh, it depends. So, so yes, there is the sol uh, solving time, but uh, depending on. So, if if you have a structured grid that fits nicely into memory, then. Uh, uh, then, then it's very homogeneous to treat, but we, we work with uh, unstructured mes meshes and there it's also quite complicated to just set up the system of equations. So it takes about equal time. So you have the, the setup of your system and then the solver. And yeah, the, for, for solving the, the matrix systems, we usually lose, use BLAS or C plus or something. Or, or what was the question then? So you parallelize both assembly yes, and yes. solution. In the end, we paralyze everything. <coughs> Back. Yep. Uh, yeah, so the, the, uh, the, the dynamic distributed object idea is interesting. Um, I was, you, you, the way it's modeled, your, the computation, it seems like the, there's that boundary exchange step that's in the middle of that sort of seems to pigeonhole you to a sense of problems. Is that not the case? Uh, no. It, but, it, but it's, of course, quite useful for stencil problems. So, but, but the idea is very generic. You just say, this is the part that we put, uh, share with another computer, and then you also can use a def method, like uh, what happens if there is a conflict and both sides have different things, and you can also average over this or, or something to resolve the conflict. So it, it's not limited to stencil codes. Yeah, I mean, I guess the cycling <coughs> Yes. Can you have the same object shared just between two uh, cores, or can you have the same object shared a thousand times and knows that it's object itself? You can share it with any number. So I can share it with a thousand cores, and each time it's locally garbage collected, we use trivial garbage to, to register this, say, okay, it got locally collected, and then in the next synchronized step, it will send a message to the others and say, I don't care anymore for this object. I don't use it. And so in the end, it will get cleaned up everywhere. So as soon as, 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 some, as some, some process doesn't need it locally, he, he, he tells the others. He tells the others, don't notify me when you update this object anymore. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We pay a, a, a very much money that it doesn't break. So, that, that's yeah. The, so most problems in distributed computing, we, we don't have them because we we solve them with with high quality network hardware. 
so usually you would try to make your applications also robust, but what, what in case a node goes down, but we don't care. Our nodes don't go down. <laughs> Um, it's always CFFI based, um, and the reason, and I try also, uh, so so from the semantics, you can just with very few C calls, you can emulate all the MPI standard functions, but we we did this, uh, we didn't do this because uh, so so every MPI fun function from CL MPI maps closely to the to the C function, because vendors have the possibility to tweak them individually. So it might be that, that semantically identical functions behave differently. And uh, yeah, so it might be that, that one or the other operation is, is faster for this. And Last question, anybody? That's it, then can I have our applause? <laughs> The CLMPI is, is, is on uh, <coughs> GitHub. I'm sorry. Um, yes. Uh, so there are also examples. If you if you want to get get started in there, so so you can just build your own executable and send messages and toy around. It's it's quite fun to use. <coughs>